Hey everybody, welcome back to On Stage, Off Stage. I'm your host, George Sapio, and this is episode number 161, January of 2023. The first episode in year number 11 of podcasting. Woohoo! Our first guest of 2023 is Sarah Sheward. Sarah is a playwright and a trauma-informed journalist whose play, The Box, which she calls legislative art, toured the U.S. in 2022, bringing the stories and realities of those held in solitary confinement to audiences across the nation. Some of these prisoners were kept there for years. Her own story parallels the experience of the prisoners portrayed in her play. It's a tragic reality that we, as humans, not only frequently fail to be, at the very least, humane to each other, but we seem to excel at inhumanity. As I said, I was, I was cruising around Facebook one day and I saw this post for The Box, uh, a play that you wrote about solitary incarceration in the United States or solitary incarceration in general. And what I read about it was absolutely fascinating, including the fact that you had actors who had actually spent time in solitary incarceration and 99.9% of the general public has no idea of the reality uh, associated with this, myself included. Um, even though I have toured a couple of prisons and have had the daylight scared out of me just by the fact that it is a prison, um, this is a reality that nobody really else sees. So please, let's talk about the box. When did you write it? Um, how did it come about? And let's talk about audience reactions. Yeah, okay. Um... Well, the first production of The Box was in 2016, so I was working on it for several years before that. It started out as an investigation. I'm a trauma-informed journalist, and I was touring the country, interviewing people in solitary confinement for mm -hmm. a couple of years. And a lot of those stories went into a book that I published and, and co-edited called Hell is a Very Small Place. Mm -hmm. I wrote people letters for six months intensively, and then I did my best to visit them wherever they were. I visited dozen facilities, solitary confinement pods in prisons from New York to Florida to California. And um, again and again, what I found was just incredible humans that had made mistakes but hadn't given up on life, even mm -hmm. though they were some of them may never get out of a small solitary confinement cell and some of them had been in for d years or decades and um just hadn't given up on cracking jokes connecting to other human beings trying to make something meaningful out of their lives um it is really really phenomenal to meet people that um yeah. just find a way to to resist you know the unimaginable and the play came out of that experience it came out of my hatred for our prison system. Um, our prison system is so deeply, deeply broken. It's creating so much harm, um, you know, exponential harm, piled on harm, piled on harm. And um, and that it affects all of us. A lot of people, especially people that may not, may not know anyone that's incarcerated or have never been incarcerated, live under the illusion that they're not being affected by this institution. But it affects everything in every other institution. It affects every community. It affects our psyche um, to live in a country where millions of people are locked in boxes. Um, and um, whether it's the solitary confinement box um, or prison as a whole, yeah. we, um, yeah, solitary confinement, all of prison is solitary confinement. All of prison is designed to isolate, to remove people and to, to, to purely, um, you know, based on the philosophy that punishing and hurting people will address the, the root causes of why harm happens in our society and in our culture. Um, and it, it, seems more, it seems more like a revenge-based process than it does about a punishment-based process. And I know there's probably a fine line between the two, but when you talk about intent, I think possibly it stems more from the general public wanting redress, wanting something to happen to these people who have done something to us, which only exacerbates the problem. 
Because as you said, it doesn't do anything to stem the root cause. So, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. No, I think that's right. And I think that the public has been lied to, um, you know, and led to believe that revenge will make us safer, will make us feel better, will prevent more crime. And it doesn't do that. Um, you know, crime is, is happens on, in, in certain because of conditions mm -hmm. will do ho horrible things because they haven't learned any better way of dealing with their feelings often. Yep. Um, a lot of the formerly incarcerated people that I know that have taken another life, they say, if I had just asked for help, I could, there, I could have done so many different things. If I hadn't been so proud, if I hadn't had this, whether it's toxic masculinity yeah. or, you know, generational victimhood, um, systemic racism, there's people don't want to hurt other people. It's, I mean, that is like the tiniest percentage. And if it even exists, I don't know. I'm not yeah. an expert, but you know, it's one in a million of the people that we lock up maybe is, is without hope, um, of, of being, um, you know, reformed or rehabilitated. Um, and everyone, you know, deserves a second chance. We, all of us want second chances, right? All of us. Oh, that yeah. are not Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. We want understand that it, that it, the worst thing that we've done doesn't define us we want people to see our humanity and mm -hmm. yet somehow we've been taught that we have to negate the humanity of millions of people um and and it is very much connected to systemic racism in our country um yeah. it came out of slavery um and and the legacy is, is still very very strong you see it everywhere a lot of the very buildings that are now you know horrific jails or prisons yeah. where people where black and brown people are being tortured were the same places where former slaves had to break rocks to to, to buy their freedom. Sure. And so legacy yeah. is, is is impossible to separate. Well, when you say slavery, I'm sure there's a lot of folks out there who are going to toss their head back and go, I think she's exaggerating just a little bit here. But when you think about how many of our prisons have become privatized, they are businesses. And the people who are incarcerated are working pretty much as society slaves, modern day slaves. And trying to get that argument across to folks is, that's always a tricky one, but I think it's a true one. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, private prisons um, are are horrible. Some of them are in some ways better than the public ones. It really depends on on the prison. Mm -hmm. um, but all prisons are are intricately interwoven into our economic system and our, our system of capitalism that you can't separate from the, the history of, of slavery and racism in this country. Um, it, I mean, it's just interwoven with all of our social problems, right? Because yes. that's where we, we dump all, we dump human beings instead of addressing, you know, what is the problem? What mm -hmm. do you, what is, um, what could possibly have driven you to this? And, um, you know, do you want to to do repair? Do, do you deserve, you know, we don't give people the chance to, to be accountable to, for their actions. But why should we re rehabilitate criminals? That's a big argument. And the reason we should rehabilitate criminals is so we don't have any more, well, we lower the amount, the number of criminals. Let's let's talk a little bit about the box. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm an audience member, I'm interested. I walk in, I sit down, the show begins. What happens? Well, it is um, four cells. Um, this last production that we toured around the country for the End of Isolation tour um, was an immersive set. So there are people seated. Each cell is its own platform, and people are seated all around. And there are corridors on each side that the guards walk down. And I played one of the prison guards, Officer Miller. And um, each prison cell has you know the bare minimum of items in it mm -hmm. and the first 10 minutes nothing happens um it's the guys just being in their cells and the the guards patrolling and a lot of people say that first 10 minutes is the most uncomfortable and the whole play is very challenging um and it's also very um empowering for a lot of people, um, particularly communities that are affected by incarceration, because the humanity of these people are shown, and also their will to live and, and continue to, to 
work on themselves, their relationships with, um, there's a father daughter relationship, um, that's, that people are very moved by and feel very seen by. Um, so it's, it, it's an intense play because it doesn't sugarcoat. Um, these people are, are in, um, are in a torture chamber. Yeah. A cell confinement, um, is torture under international law. How big are these cells? Uh, the cells are, well, the platforms are slightly smaller than the average cell. I think the average cell in the U.S. is seven by 10 feet. And I mm -hmm. think the platforms are a little bit smaller than that, six by nine. Um, you should ask my stage manager. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, they're small. Um, and um, the guys are, you know, cleaning. Um, one guy cleans compulsively all the time and organizes his few possessions over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Another guy is shadow boxing. Another one is he spends all of his life reading. Um, the Jake Juchow, the white supremacist, former white supremacist character. Um, well, he hasn't completely disavowed white supremacy, but um, he doesn't believe in it as a philosophy. Um, he just still has, you know, certain affiliations in order sure. to survive. Um inside prison um usually it's your racial group that has your back if you want to have um if you want to call that a gang or you know a racially affiliated group mm -hmm. and that's how prisons run and um that's is encouraged by the prison administration um because it's easier to control um a group of people that's turned you know that's fighting it's each other yeah. and um and um so they don't band together and organize against the administration itself sure, um, yeah. So, yeah, so the, the play is about a new guy coming into the pod with these three veterans, um, OG wow. um, guy, Black Panther, and a um, Latino and a, a white guy. They're all politicized to a degree, um, and but they haven't spoken to each other barely in years, other than there's, a, there's an economy of exchange that happens inside the, where people can you know, one guy can sew boxer shorts. And so he might trade some food um, to get some extra food from the commissary because he doesn't, he's too proud to accept money from his daughter. And so he, he will, you know, have like an economic um, barter system sure. with the white supremacist guy, even though he hates his guts. But a new guy comes in, Rocky, and um, he's angry, he's upset, he's also kind of hilarious and weird and goofy. And the Black Panther starts to try to talk some reason into him, stop him from fighting the guards, insulting the guards, insulting Officer Miller. Um, and because um, he doesn't want him to get tickets on top of, you know, he could be there for just a couple months, he could end up being there for years if he if he digs a hole deeper for himself. So the guys and kind of is, is that a typical possibility to be in a seven by 10 cell for years? Yeah, it's very, um, there are 80 to a hundred thousand people in any given day. And we don't actually know the number because the reason mm -hmm. that our prisons have gotten to have become the monstrosity that they have gotten to is, is largely neglect and incompetence because we don't have oversight. Every European country has a, an, an oversight board that is separate from the prison institution yes. that can come in unannounced and see if indeed the tax dollars are being used effectively um and in the, the prisoners are being you know treated with humanity and rehabilitated so that when they're put back in society they're they're brought back with in better off than they went in right there's the idea right so we yeah Papers. <laughs> um, and of course, Norway is touted as, as the amazing, amazing example of that. Um, and from what I've heard, it is. And, and um, you know, I call myself a prison abolitionist in, in the context of our prisons in this country. Yeah. I don't believe there's anything to be salvaged because I think that they were, they have to, they have to be, we have to start over from the root in, for, to have a real system of justice. We can't just reform what we have because mm -hmm. it's beyond broken. Every reform for the most part, it just um, justifies and legitimizes the system so that a lot of people that want to feel comfortable with the system as it is and, and put their heads back in the sand can be like, oh, we passed a law. Yay. We, sure, we made yeah. 
development, right? We tweak to the system, but the system is so deeply broken by by um, design, really. It's not designed to rehabilitate people. So I believe in, I'm an abolitionist in the, in the American context is I think we have to completely re-envision our system of justice. Um, in a place like Norway, if I lived in Norway, I'm not so sure that I'd be an abolitionist. It's, it's a very different context. It sounds um, so different. And it, it, the conventional wisdom, if, if there is any such thing as conventional wisdom, seems to have been saying over the past number of years that the U.S. prison system is one of the worst in the world and one of the most inhumane. And it breeds... Redisivism, re, a word I usually can't pronounce, re, dis, recidivism. Yes. Recidivism. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Recidivism. Ah. No. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's, that's why people say by design, because you look at the laws and it's almost as it, it's clear that they want to keep the prisons full. Mm-hmm. And that's why don't build any more prisons, because if you build them, there's a way that the laws will adjust yeah. and then all of a sudden they're going to be full. Um, and, you know, our, our prison system has been growing and solitary confinement even more. This is a word that I struggle with. Let's see if you can help me. Precipitously. 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 Um, yeah, precipitously. Um, okay. Hey, good the trade. Of solitary confinement has been growing more precipitously. Precipitously. Um, yes. the overall prison population it's good it's good that we can have a little laughter or something Uh, yeah because we need it with this conversation so so depressing that people want to turn away and that's why i wrote a play about um about resistance because Mm -hmm. um so what happens to rocky um you know it's it's amazing when you get to meet these people you want to fight for them you don't want to want to you want them back out here you know Mm -hmm. Um, and um so well, I mean, what happens, I don't, I mean, I guess well, you want me to- don't, don't, don't give anything away, but I mean, well, already um, I'm interested to see what happens to this guy. And yeah, well, it's very tragic. Um, yeah. At the end of that one, Rocky takes his own life. And, wow. um, and suicide is also much higher in solitary confinement yeah. than in general prison population. And um, he's the catalyst for these guys to come together and say, we need to do something. Um, you know, they've divided us long enough. They put us in there. They put us in here thinking we'd never talk to each other. And they gave us power without even knowing it is one line. Because all of them are, are influential leaders in their racial groups. Right. And so this is based on the historic event of the California 2013 prisoner hunger strike. So the play is based on a true event where um, the same thing happened in um, Pelican Bay State Prison in the short corridor right. where the or the um, gang leaders or racial group leaders came together and and made a call for a hunger strike. And over 20,000 people across California came together across racial lines. And they also signed an agreement to end racial hostilities, which was a monumental and historic, it was the largest hunger strike in California history. Um, So that's what the play is based on, um, inspired by, I would say. And, and, And that's what happens in the play. Okay. What was the audience reaction like to this? I mean, because it sounds obviously incredibly powerful. And, you know, it's not your average musical. It's not a musical at all. But, I mean, it's it's theater that is highly, highly serious and highly revealing, um, transformative, I would guess. I mean, what did the audience walk out saying? I mean, what what did you hear? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've had so many different reactions Um, In 2016, we've also had very different um, productions Mm -hmm. and design. Um, And in 2016, it was so loud and the the set was stunning. We had these cells stacked on cells. So there were six cells and two two tiers. Right. Um, And and people in the cells were were surrounded by um, um, fence, like metal fence. Chain link fence. Yeah. Yeah. So you could see these cages and mm-hmm. it was like an insane asylum and the the design, the sound and visuals were so dialed up. People walked out. There was um, there were people that, that I, I saw a pregnant woman. You're like, whoa, I don't think this whoa. is, you yeah. know, another person, you know, when the guy took his the prisoner took his shirt off and, the, and had a swastika t- tattooed on his chest, people walked out. Sure. Um, 
And so we toned it down to a degree because we wanted both for two reasons, that there's a two prong audience. It's people that don't know what it's like in prison, that a lot of people in that first production were so shell shocked after act one that they, they were just in disbelief in mm-hmm. this cognitive dissonance. It can't really be that bad. Um, how can we do this to our fellow human beings? This is exaggerated. Uh, you know, did you really, you know, maybe this was as ba- bad for you, right? And that's goes back to my story and my own incarceration. But they'll say, oh, maybe it's that bad in places like Iran, but not here. Yeah. And But you want people to, you, you don't want the theater to be so abrasive that people can't stay or don't stay, right? And so we kind of yeah. toned down the design and to also because there's this balance between the horror, showing the horror and showing the humanity of the people. And if the horror gets too dialed up, you lose the humanity. I, mm-hmm. I, and so I, I think we really struck the right balance um, for the End of Isolation tour last summer. We toured to 10 cities and it was very clear our objective was legislative art, going to places where communities are fighting this practice, are fighting to decarcerate. Because the best way to end solitary confinement in our prisons is to decarcerate, to, to um, shrink our prison population because it's inevitable the more people we have in our prisons the more overcrowded the more people that are there that that have no business being there that need help that need treatment the more people are going to end up tortured in solitary confinement it's a control mechanism within our prisons and it's often um the most vulnerable populations that are subjected to it not the worst of the worst not Mm -hmm. the serial killers um it's it's the mentally ill it's the lgbtq it's pregnant women um it's the people that pe- that the prison administration can't deal with because they shouldn't be in prison mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's not a place for them and so they put them in these conditions that make them far worse so these audiences that we travel to were large like communities that are heavily impacted by you know, the audience heavily impacted by incarceration, formerly incarcerated themselves, system impacted. So there was a grieving. There was um, more than once at the end of Act One, we had heard people sobbing. And um, really, there, I would be backstage hearing the sobbing and then the, the, the silence and the slow kind of murmuring of the audience of people uh, reaching out, you know, giving comfort. Um, but people stayed. I, I didn't see anyone walk out in our 10 cities t- tour. Yeah. Um, and by the end of act two, some of this, often the same person that was sobbing would say, you know, that was me. That was extremely triggering, you know, to see the young Rocky take his life. It's just so horrifying. And then, but now by the end of act two, I feel empowered. I feel seen. I feel like this collective healing. I feel held. We really created we were able to through our just I think energetically and then through our um, engagement piece at the end mm-hmm. of every show, which is very trauma informed and and somatic. We help people get stay in their bodies, breathe, shake out their anger and pain. We do a divine scream before we start talking about it because we don't want people to stay stuck in yeah. that head. We want to, like you said, shift it and transform it. And um, you know, use this as a tool for change. So, so, so a lot of the same people that were sobbing at the end of of Act One were feeling very empowered and grateful and connected by the end of Act Two. That's amazing. The fact that you even had actors who had spent time in solitary uh, yeah, is incredible. Happened. Yeah, it's, it's just. Um, what was their experience? I mean, can you give us a couple of minutes on. You've you've spent time in solitary and all of a sudden now you're on stage in a space that is similar to it. I mean, that's that's mm, I don't even know where to begin with that. Yeah, I mean it was definitely it was a hard, it was definitely we we toured the country in a converted school bus. We we definitely needed to stay in more and more Airbnbs and not on yeah. the bus. Because we needed, you know, it was it was hard to take care of ourselves, hard to take care of each other, a, you know, grueling tour. Yeah. But, if, but people, I mean, especially the formerly incarcerated people in our crew were the ones that really wanted it, that really needed it. Um, mm-hmm. and so much nourishment from the audiences, so much nourishment from seeing the face of this movement um, across the country. You know, from from Fayetteville, Arkansas to, you know, Baltimore to Austin, Texas, just to see again and again, you know, just these incredibly, you know, passionate um, and resilient 
badass organizers, many of them formerly incarcerated themselves, families, um, they're not going anywhere. You know, there's there's no way to put the cat in the bag when it comes to the movement of, you know, resistance to our prison system. People are never going to give up or stop, um, you know, stop demanding something better. And so, you know, it's this balance between being very inspired and very exhausted and, and, and often triggered by the experience. I mean, I think for... Um, I can't, you know, I can, I think I can speak for at least a few, two of the formerly incarcerated actors. Um, It really brought back, their characters became more and more like who they were in prison. And, you know, you have to love your character and their characters would, you know, just bring up parts of themselves that maybe had been buried. Because when you leave solitary confinement in particular, it's hard. Most people don't talk about it. Um, You know, I, I spent a year in solitary confinement in very different conditions. I was held as a political hostage by the Iranian government after living and working in the Middle East. Um, And and I lived in a, in a um, refugee camp. I was doing humanitarian work as as well as journalism. And I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and got captured. Um, This is 12 years ago now. And I I've had, I've had the opportunity and, and, you know, I've been called to talk about my story again and again. Yes. I, it's almost as if it happened to someone else. I've talked about it so much, but you know, most people um, don't talk about it. And if you don't talk about it, then it gets locked in some deeply mm-hmm. accessible room in your psyche and your soul and your spirit. And so I think that is part of the catharsis of a play like this is people, because that's, and also it's also what gives so much power to, um, to our prison system or power, not power, impunity. That's where the impunity comes from is that it's invisible. It's yeah. out of sight, out of mind, mm-hmm. not, not discussed. And um, so, you know, I think the catharsis is, is and the healing is also struggle and is also hard. So it was, it was not, an, it was a struggle summer. And, and, you know, we, we call our bus the healing bus, but it's also the struggle bus because like, sure. yeah. you know, it brought up it brought up a lot for a lot of us but people you know people had each other's backs no one got covid um the bus our, we have an amazing bus driver rob connell who is my co-organizer and zeph fishlin our stage manager they d- devised this phenomenal brilliant load in and load out on top of the bus you know lighting sound we um every performance was phenomenal everybody showed up for the work you know yeah. thousand percent I've I've heard the term theater in a box where you walk in and just pop it into somebody's already existing space, but it was the first time I heard theater in a bus. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, t- the technical aspects is a whole nother show right there, um, which I would love to get into at some point because I love tech work. Um, I want to, I just want to say, I really love this word decarcerate. Yeah. And that's a word we should be using a lot more because as you said the prison system in this country is worse than inhumane um and i do want to get to your experience in iran you were you were taken captive and you were there for humanitarian reasons so what happened i mean why all of a sudden you're out for a walk one day and then your whole life just severely changes what happened yeah, well, um, I mean, I am. I've I've lived a big life. I'm a very adventurous person, mm-hmm. and um, I was I wasn't just out for a walk. I was hiking in northern Iraq, right. Iraqi Afghanistan. Um, so I was on a trip no, northern Iraq at the time. This was before ISIS. So at the time, no American had ever been killed there. It wasn't a war zone. It was a very pro-American part of the Middle East. What year is uh, this? 2009 and 2010. Okay. okay. Uh, the Iraqi Kurds were protected by uh, George Bush from Saddam Hussein. So there was like a George Bush high five. A lot of people just excited sure. to see. Yes. Um, so I didn't agree with, you know, I don't, I'm not, I don't really like being um, celebrated for that reason because I, I'm, I, the reason I moved to the Middle East is because I'm very anti war. And in my 20s, I was really active in the anti war movement against mm-hmm. the, was in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I was teaching Iraqi refugees in Syria. Um, but our our guards were down in northern Iraq. I traveled in Yemen. I traveled in you know, Palestine, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, 
and I wasn't in a war zone. I wasn't in a scary place that hates Americans. I was in a place that was pro-American. So we were advised to go. We saw posters of a waterfall. And so we wanted to go for a hike. It was very green and beautiful there. And there were there were hundreds of other families um, camping there, Kurdish yes. family. And if we made any mistake, we hiked too far. And we hiked, we wanted to get to the top of the ridge. And it turned out the top of that ridge was an unmarked border where left unmarked intentionally. So smuggling could happen between Iraqi Kurdistan and Iran. Um, but of course, the, I mean, we were just such a valuable, like, um, you know, pawns to you know, just walk into the laps of the Iranian government. They, um, I think if anything, there was, indeci- there was indecision, which is why we were there for so long. I was there mm-hmm. for 410 days in solitary. Oh my Canada. God. And um, the, the hardliners wanted to, to keep us. I mean, if they could, they, they would have probably had executed us um, and framed us as spies. Um, but the more diplomatic wing of the Iranian government wants to have good standing internationally. And so there were a lot of governments that were um, the Swiss government, the Omani government, um, eventually the Iraqi government and the Venezuelan government got involved. And these are allies that mm-hmm. wants to be the Iranian government and President Ahmadinejad wanted to be in good standing with. So eventually the pressure just got too great against them. And, you know, it's diminishing returns. We're not as valuable if um, if they're losing respect in other areas. It's just not worth it. So they That's- let us go. After 410 days, you said, my God, that's I, why would it take so long? I mean, you were, th- you were three hikers. You really had. Well, the Iranian government doesn't have any other leverage. I mean, this is yeah. what happens when the U S the U S has been, um, the U S took out their democratic leader intentionally with a, with a coup. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. But, and since, and then the Iranian revolution happened and, you know, became very anti-American. And so the Iranian government uses that, the, you know, their criticism of America's foreign policy in, in you know, in trying to control um, Iranian politics. Yeah. And, um, you know, they use that as an excuse to oppress their own people. And, and they, um, and the same thing with the whole nuclear project, they want a seat at the table. They want a voice just like every other country wants a sure. voice yeah. and yes, refuses to give them a seat at the table. So they're going to use, continue to, uh, to use, um, illegitimate inhumane mm-hmm. means. Um, I don't agree with it. I don't think it's justified. And, no. um, but they wanted, in our case, I think you referred to humanitarian. We later found out that they were using us as um, leverage to get the U.S. to just sit down yeah. behind the scenes and have a conversation around the nuclear deal that Obama eventually passed. And of course, Trump destroyed. Um, mm-hmm. So, And that is, you know, countries talking to each other, sitting around, coming up with a deal to protect and de-escalate very good thing um so in a sense um our you know my suffering wasn't in vain it wasn't used for something bad which is what i hated but it's not justified because you know governments should should be doing better than this like we should be doing better all the way across the board and you know i wouldn't even dream of diminishing your your suffering for an, an ulterior motive because you were kept in a foreign country that we have been demonizing for many, many years. The average American has, in the single digits, you know, actual knowledge of what happens in the Middle East. Very few of us ever go there, right, yeah. as tourists. Very few of us ever go there to discover what these folks are like. And once you do go there and you discover, hey, they're just people, it's the governments that, that that go nuts and they, they make the situation so much worse than it ever happens to be. Um, yeah, exactly. Well put. And, I, you know, and I, and I, I think that that is, is a really important point. I mean, I feel so expanded in many ways by my experience. I mean, I'm never I will, I'll never be the same. There was a loss of innocence, a loss mm-hmm. of, of um, just kind of. Um, so in, you know, in some ways you have to rebuild your empathy because there's just a lot, there's a woundedness that comes. Yeah. 
you know, and a kind of there's anger and all kinds of, of negative long-term effects um, of what I went through. But I do feel that I, my consciousness, my spirit was expanded by that. I mean, the women inside the solitary confinement pod that I was in, just such incredible. These are some of the, the these are the women on the front lines of the green movement. They're political prisoners. Yeah. So they're human rights lawyers and they did everything they could to to try to show me love and 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 you know reach out to me, singing to me. If I was ever taken out of the cell and, and another woman recognized me in the hallway, she would just throw her arms around me and um, we'd be crying together. It's just like such a beautiful, like, it, and the same thing, you find this in prisons, you find this, you know, everywhere where humans, where you try to strip humans of their humanity yeah. and our, you know, our need to connect to one another, you see the best of humanity come out um, and you feel it come out of yourself. And it's very, very powerful. But that's only to a degree because eventually people do get crushed. You know, yes. I wasn't there long enough to be broken, but eventually, you know, that's what these, these systems are devised to do is to break people, break mm -hmm. their will, break their humanity and, and, and break their, their, their desire to, 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 um, improve themselves, to contribute to society, you know, to, to, to love and grow and, and, you know, fulfill their potentially. That's what gets broken. That's what gets lost. And that's, what, that's a loss for all of us. Yeah. It's almost like a grand plot to destroy any attempt to make this a better place to be. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, that's, mm, I, there were 5,000 questions I want to ask you about this, but we don't have the time for this. I, but I do want to get back to um, the box. And a lot of people say, well, theater doesn't really, you know, theater is theater. And it's it's nice to have something artistic and make a statement, but what good is it we are ever going to do us? And the box is a perfect example. I mean, it didn't categorically changed the entire prison system. Um, but you did have some of an effect. And for what it's worth, California State Bill, um, Senate Bill 1143, is something that could be argued was in, in some way a direct result of the box being you know, art that, you know, legislative art, tools for change, social, you know, social change art. And it's an amazing thing. Um, and before I keep talking like this, tell me more about this bill, because this directly affects it. Yeah, so that that, that was originally called the Stop the Torture of Children Act. Um, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, passed uh, in 2017 and Senator Mark Leno was a big supporter of the box continues to support my, our work and um, that's where the idea of legislative art came from that's why we chose with the end of isolation tour to travel to cities mm -hmm. where there is a bill that they're trying to pass or they've passed but it hasn't been properly implemented or um, they it's passed but it's not enough because um, that's one of the things with these movements is people work to pass a bill and then they have to work to make sure that it's actually implemented, that the right. prisons um, do what they're supposed to do and abide by the law. Um, and so these that's why these grassroots organizers around the country are the ones doing the work that our government and, and should be doing um, in, in making sure that that um, that people are not abused inside our prisons, that people are treated like human beings. And so, there's, a, there's a concept. Yeah, yeah. Treated with a little dignity. I mean, yes, they've committed crimes and some of them horrific, but for the most part, these are people who made bad mistakes and they can be rehabilitated. They can be, their lives can be turned around to something, you know, productive and fulfilling. Yeah. And, you know, I think that, that we, in, like abolition work, abolitionist work in this country, it's everyone that's contributing to the positive institutions that are meeting the needs of the most needy in our country. So it's the, it's the nurses, it's the people, the, re, the taking the recycling, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. the therapists, right? It's the body workers, it's the teachers. The, to me, that's all abolitionist work because it's meeting the needs yes. of the people in our society. And when people's needs are met and people are treated with dignity and humanity, then, um, they're less likely to end up in prison. Mm -hmm. Of course, many people 
are targeted just because of systemic racism. There's right. nothing to do with anything that they did. So the people fighting racism, obviously fighting racism is abolitionist work. Fighting against domestic violence is abolitionist work. You know, men doing their work um, on their toxic masculinity is abolitionist work. Mm -hmm. uh, all of it is contributing to a world where um, prisons are not how we deal with our problems. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Senator Leno was very emboldened by it was a, when the box came out in San Francisco and the fact that I have a high profile um, presence um, and I get I can garner, you know, my story garners media. There's been a lot of media around all the different productions and, you know, all of that trickles down and helps build, you know, it's we're a droplet in a wave. Um, there's a lot of a million things contribute to the successes and the changing not you know legislative is one way to to measure success and it's mm -hmm. a limited way it's important but yes. um the story that people have about who are we incarcerating and why has changed in california because of the prisoner hunger strike um who are we putting in solitary confinement and why once once the story of the of enough people changes then politicians will respond to that legislation stems from that mm -hmm. right storytelling is in and of itself what um what changes um policies and how we treat each other and you know has that long-term effect and it can't be taken away we can't have a new no. president come in and then then take away once people know the truth and and, and have their hearts have been changed um that's that's lasting you that's know, like that's, putting the toothpaste back in the tube you can't do it you can't do it it's generational no. you, know, you yeah. raise your you um yeah. you talk to your neighbors differently you take care of your elders differently um small humanitarian victories little yes. bit by little bit that's yeah. why we're all still here <laughs> I yeah <think>. yeah <laughs> let me ask you this because you said that the three of you in iran were used as political pawns and mm -hmm. by the government to achieve something else do you see any similarities between yourself and Brittany griner who's being held by the Russians now because she they, they're claiming she walked in with drugs and, you know, it could be a simple misunderstanding. They could let her go, but yeah, absolutely. Just, yeah. I mean, yeah, what's, absolutely. what's that trying to do? Nothing good. Nothing good yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know all the details, but I definitely right. support Brittany and I definitely support her freedom um, and I don't think she deserves to be imprisoned um, and all of this becomes political right and it all yeah. goes back who's to blame our country our, our governments you know they both they are the ones that are responsible for mm -hmm. and um, and for averting war and keeping us safe and you know I've been a um, critic of my government's foreign policy for a very long time you know since um, my 20s when I was in the anti-war movement yeah we much much better when it comes to diplomacy and preventing Americans getting caught up in um you know these these are these are it, it's like um you could call it utilitarianism you know they're, they're it's a means to an end but who you know who is it hurting it's hurting people on both sides it's hurting Russians it's hurting Americans it hurts the innocents mm -hmm. innocent people are the ones that get caught in this thing you know yeah. it's 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 not like we're sending the politicians. There was a commercial 30, 40 years ago where it postulated that instead of sending the people out to war, we put the two leaders into a ring and have them duke it out. Um, <laughs> and I know it was silly, but it, it spoke to a common truth that war is the inevitability of failed policy and the inability for humans to recognize each other as humans even though we're grossly different in many, in many ways. And that's, that's, that's a positive thing in most cases mm -hmm. because we build and we grow and, and we discover and we become kinder people, you know, mm -hmm. our species improves. And it's just a shame to see all this inability to make that happen to, you know, just, just look into our hearts and, and try and do something to improve the lives of people who need a second chance. Mm -hmm. We need a chance in the first place. Cause like you said before, many of us don't have that. Many people we know, many people we see don't right. have that. Right, you know? right. 
So, yeah. And, and, you know, you may not see that on the news, but it is happening out in the world and and in the country. I mean, for us traveling for two months, you know, meeting people on the front lines, just the Mm -hmm. humanity. And this was, you know, 10 years after my original investigation of traveling across the country and going inside prisons. And people, you can get too caught up in, in, you know, all of the like, whatever makes it into the news. I'm not saying it's not important to know what's going on in the world, but like people don't pay attention to what people are doing in their own communities and, um, and how inspiring it is. And we're doing, we're doing a documentary about the tour that shows the face of a lot of these communities, Mm -hmm. you know, instead of, yeah, it's just like, I think that we don't necessarily, yes, things are really bad. Yes. Things are really dismal. Yes governments are to blame for almost all of it but we also are are a lot of us doing the important work of changing ourselves and um you know doing the anti-racist work doing our own um healing work as far as like what what stories and belief systems have been passed down to us that don't serve us anymore that um if we're going to come together as people and look at our collective um future and the, the collective interests we share, um, everybody needs to to do their own work in their own community. And that is enough, sure. you know, don't, like, don't give up. Don't, 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 yeah. don't decide that things are too bad and it doesn't matter because mm-hmm. everything, matters, every single thing that we do in order to, to heal and grow and live in alignment with our values, it's like, you know, droplets in a wave, the wave just grows and grows. Absolutely. And that's what we're not taught. You know, we, we, we're, we see the illusion that, yes, we can change the world. No, you can change your community. You can change the, 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 the housing development you live in. You can change something about your neighbor's life for the better. You can make a small change. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, if it's not big and it's not grand, it's not worth it. And that's nonsense. That's always been nonsense. It's looking around you and doing something good for somebody else who may in turn turn around and do the same thing for somebody else. And that's how that's how we make ourselves better. Sarah Shure, this has been... Don't um, forget our incarcerated people because they need us to yeah. make lives better. Yes. <laughs> yes, I know. I, uh, for our neighbors as well and our returning citizens. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for talking about all this difficult work you've been doing and the, the very difficult time you spent uh, in around, which I don't think I'll stop thinking about for a very long time. Just, yeah, this is really great having you here. It was really great. Yeah, I'm excited about um, I just want to say hi to your audience and just everyone can reach me. I'm really easy to reach at sarahshore.com. Okay. Um, I just love to hear from anyone who was interested in this work and wants encouragement or direction. And um, yeah, we're all stronger together. So thank you for doing this, George. Anytime. Hey kids, thanks for listening to On Stage, Off Stage. On Stage, Off Stage is produced monthly and all of our shows can be found at onstageoffstage.org and also on iTunes and Spotify. If you enjoy what we do, please recommend us to your friends. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at OnOffStage. And if you are a theater artist with an upcoming project of interest or know of someone in the theater who'd make some seriously good chat, By all means, send us a note at info at onstageoffstage.org. I'm George Sapio. Thank you once again for listening. And please, stay safe. Be careful not only for yourself, but for those with whom we all share this rock. And as always, happy theatering to all of you.